The next project is um, a project really close to my heart and over my head. Um, I, in, in the 1970s, I graduated from the University of Michigan, and my wife Jill and I designed and personally built the passive solar earth sheltered green roofed house in my industrial design studio. Very experimental building, self invented, self planted roof. It took me five years to get it to grow. After, after five years, for 30 years, zero maintenance. So the dang thing started leaking after 35 years. I guess it didn't owe me a dime. Um, so I was smart enough, being much older and wiser than when I personally built the house in 78, to get the pros to do the renovation of my green roof. So I would like to introduce um, some really interesting people. Uh, Sam Popst, sustainability consultant of Ecometrics, is going to start out positioning the project. Sam is a lead fellow, lead F. He used to be lead AP, yada, 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 yada. Now it's so much easier. He's now lead fellow. There aren't very many of them, so his acronym is nice and tidy now. Uh, and I was really pleased to have him as a consultant, um, his incredible experience with sustainable buildings. And then Advanced Green Architecture, Eric Kronk and Jeremiah Johnson are going to elaborate on um, replacing uh, my owner-built invented green roof with an really cool West Michigan designed, engineered, built, tooled uh, green roof tray system with West Michigan grown plants. Uh, and Sam, would you give us the story? Well, thanks, Tom. I think any of you that know Tom uh, he is kind of the quintessential sustainability geek, and uh, uh, it was a real pleasure to work with him on this project. Um, he invited me in to kind of help him uh, understand, you know, what current technology was. I mean, he was doing this 35 years ago, and things have moved on a bit since then. And so I just wanted to kind of give you an understanding of what, where we started with the project. And so this is really the, the plan of his, of his building. He did an addition over on the, on the west end to, the, to your left, and there's a little bit of a porch on the south end. Um, the construction that he did back in the 70s is called Trom Wall Construction. And if you're not familiar with that, it was, it was pretty revolutionary in the 70s. Um, in the lower level where you see that red, uh, there's a, on the right hand side of that red and blue is a, is a 16 inch thick concrete wall. And in the, in the winter time, the sun penetrates, is low in the sky, the sun penetrates those windows. That wall is painted black and it absorbs the solar radiation and then it re-radiates that into the house at night. So it tempers it. Uh, so that, that goes up into the living room, which, which goes across the entire south end of the house, it cools off, circulates, and, and, and cools down, and then goes back into that, that plenum and mixes again and starts the cycle all over. So uh, this is really, I, I love the no, no mechanical, no moving parts aspect of this. Uh, very elegant design. I, I think uh, that's one of the things that, that uh, uh, is really kind of emblematic of, of Tom's kind of design design principles. Uh, also on the right side, you see the it's an earth berm, and then he had built a, a vegetated roof on the top. Um, to to illustrate how efficient this was, uh, he doesn't have any gas. Everything. This is four thousand square feet of home. He works out of his home. He has a, a woodworking shop where he does all of his prototypes in there. And so all of his cooking, his, uh, he, he does have auxiliary heating, electric heating. Uh, all of this, uh, his lighting and everything is $2,200 a year. That's really an incredible utility bill for 4,000 square feet of a building. Uh, it's very comfortable. Uh, he, he had built a, he had put in a wood stove at the time. Everybody was doing wood stoves. and. And now he's not comfortable to burning wood because of the pollutants associated with that, so he doesn't do it. The electric baseboard heaters, which were supplementary, are seldom used. And, and uh, as you get older, you like to be comfortable, so on summer days, you put in cooling. 
<laughs> so there's a small uh, cooling unit in the bedroom. Uh, so the maintenance is, is very simple on all of this. And we were called in really to deal with a leaky roof after 35 years. And uh, what's, what we found, uh, what we, we, we had a number of things that we wanted to look at um, and another, a number of options to consider. Uh, we could have served his purposes with a white membrane roof, which would have reflected light. Um, we, we could have done the vegetated roof uh, built in place. We could have put in a tray system. Uh, we could have done an intensive or extensive vegetated roof. Um, we could have put in photovoltaic panels. And as all of these options came up, you can imagine uh, Tom wanted to do all of them. Um, and uh, we could add insulation. We could do a, a standing seam metal roof. Durability was one of the things that we were concerned about. Um, and, and the thermal values uh, were, was another thing that we were concerned about. And uh, also, Tom was, uh, there was an, an error made in the engineering of it when it was built. And so he had to go up there and shovel the snow off of it when it got beyond a certain level uh, to make sure that it was structurally safe. And uh, so we wanted to see what we could do in the redesign to, to reduce that load. So we went through all of these different iterations and ended up putting in a tray system, a vegetated roof tray system. And this was our preliminary design. Um, at some point along the line, I had been considering this national wildlife certification uh, for my own home. And, and I just, just kind of thinking out loud threw that out on the table. And these two guys took off with it and got really excited about it. And the next thing I knew, we were certifying it as a national wildlife uh, sort of, uh, or getting it certified for uh, with the National Wildlife Certification. There are three things that you need to do. That's to have a water source, you have to have biodiversity, and you have to have habitat. And I'll let them talk about that a little bit more later on. Uh, the cost is about the rough equivalent of doing a standing seam metal roof. Uh, and, and you should get a pro about the same durability in terms of the, the length of life on it. Uh, the vegetated roof costs are coming down as we get more and more exposure to the construction process. Uh, we did get a significant surprise in the construction, uh, and that is as we, Tom had installed it with four inches of topsoil, uh, and we found eight inches of topsoil up there. And 35 years of accumulated vegetative matter grows. And uh, I don't know if you know, but four inches, if you think of lifting a, top, a shovel full of dirt, uh, a square foot of four inches of topsoil is 25 pounds. That's a pretty significant structural load. Uh, so it's, it's probably a good thing you were up there shoveling all that time. Um, so, whoops, don't need to do that. Uh, so that's something you need to consider. Obviously, he had a lot of trees that were overhanging, and, and that added that contributed to it. Uh, you have to consider that in, in the design of a roof. Uh, how, how are you going to maintain the roof, or, or how are you going to design for the future? Uh, the, one of the advantages of a vegetated roof is that it protects the membrane below it from ultraviolet radiation. And the roof that had been originally installed was a PVC roof. It was a new technology back in the 70s that everybody was excited about. And it lasted for about 10 years before all of the companies that manufactured it, it went bankrupt. Um, because it turned out that after 10 years, the UV degradation made them shatter. And we think it lasted 35 years just because uh, it had this protection, this UV protection over the top of it. Uh, we, had a, we found a couple of holes in it from, we think, branches that fell through and penetrated it, and then there was some degradation around the perimeter uh, that we couldn't control. Uh, there's some thermal performance that you get from uh, vegetated matter uh, to some degree, um, and, it, and I won't go into a lot of detail on that. We do get some cooling benefit from the evapotranspiration as, as the uh, moisture radiates off the roof. 
uh, there's an acoustic performance associated with it uh, that, it, that it dampens the sound of any rain that's falling on the roof that's really quite nice. Uh, it acts as storm, for stormwater mitigation. And uh, so for every square foot of a vegetated roof that you have up there is another square foot of rainwater that you don't need to account for in your stormwater calculations. So there's a benefit for that in terms of stormwater management. And then uh, there's also a consideration of what you need to, to think about in terms of maintenance. How are you going to maintain this? Uh, over the lifetime, what are the costs associated with it, and what are the benefits? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric and Jeremiah to kind of describe the process. Uh, they have invented this particular system, and, uh, and th this is what we ended up with. It's a brilliant system, and, but, but more important, I think, than what we ended up with is, is the benefit of the biodiversity that we've included in, in here. And, and I think you'll like their presentation. Thanks, Sam. Um, my name is Eric Kronk, and just quickly want to show this picture uh, just to show the system that we ended up going with. Uh, like Sam mentioned, this is a, a system that we developed, manufactured, and grown here in West Michigan. Um, it's, a, it's a modular type system, 18-inch uh, by 18-inch uh, tray modules. You'll see the advantage of using a modular system um, when we go through some of the pictures of the removal of the existing uh, green roof. That was quite a project in itself just to get uh, the vegetation and, and soil that had been up there for 35 years and it allowed to evolve over time naturally. So um, there's some benefits to a modular system in that sense. Uh, we also have integrated a few, um, I guess, plant science features that help with long-term sustainable plant growth. Um, and, and some irrigation things like that, but just you know, basic uh, idea is that we use this modular system to replace uh, the existing the existing green roof. Um, and so, we introduced this idea of uh, creating a wildlife habitat or in increasing biodiversity um, to Tom, and he really had never even thought that that was a possibility on a rooftop. Uh, so uh, it's something that we like to promote, um, I guess, in our company. Uh, the majority of green roofs are done, have typically been done for stormwater uh, and energy benefits, like Sam was describing. So where we like to bring added value in terms of doing a green roof design is um, designing to increase ecosystem services or increasing biodiversity and wildlife habitat. So basically trying to recreate the functions that natural ecosystems perform and, and bring that value on a green roof uh, in space that typically provides no value uh, for wildlife or habitat. And our, uh, our biodiverse system, like I mentioned, is specifically designed um, to do that. So we took uh, Tom's, the preliminary design that um, Tom had kind of come up with, the idea, and we just built off of that to include a lot of these biodiversity considerations. So there's three main factors that go into creating uh, biodiverse green roofs. Um, these are just very general design principles that I'll, I'll just briefly describe. But they're uh, substrate types, so what types of uh, growth media are you using, uh, how deep of soils you can get. Um, you know, typically green roofs use very shallow soil profiles, so um, you know, increasing that depth can help with increasing biodiversity. And then uh, finally, the types of plants that you use and the, the different you know, plant diversity that you can achieve uh, on the roof. So first kind of principle is use a variety of substrate types. Um, it's, it's good to use green roof media, uh, different types of gravels, um, na native soils, and, and the idea is that you create these varying microclimates uh, in the soil profile. Some soils, like green roof media, is pretty well drained, coarse, um, and you compare that to a gravel that holds different levels of moisture and also heats up to uh, different temperature levels. So um, the idea, you know, creating these different types of habitats that might attract more types of bugs which in turn will attract more types of birds to eat those bugs. So um, this, you know, this is the idea. A couple pictures here of just showing some gravel incorporated into uh, some of the plant areas. Um, another uh, concept is using the local soils. So essentially, the soil that was displaced from the building foundation. Uh, this can be difficult to do because topsoil is very heavy. 
uh, green roof media is lightweight. Um, but we did incorporate some local soils on the Tom's roof, and that's really neat because that introduces a lot of the natural seed banks that are just existing um, in the soil profiles naturally. So we'll show some pictures of how we did that on Tom's roof as well. Next concept for biodiverse roofs is the depth of substrate. Uh, deeper substrates allow you to do more types of plants. I mentioned typically green roofs are very shallow. Intensive roofs, um, you know, build that soil depth up. Uh, so creating deeper soil profiles allows you to use more types of plants. It also helps, um, you know, by contouring soil and building up the soil depths allows more invertebrate species to basically create their home there. You know, the deeper soils you find more bugs building um, building their homes there. And then, um, again, just, you know, the types of plants is, is, a big, is a big deal for promoting the biodiversity and, and using um, native plants. Uh, it's typically hard to do on a green roof, but if you can get that soil depth to, uh, you know, more like 8 to 12 inches of soil, um, that's when you can really start doing some neat things uh, with the types of plants that, that you can put on there. And then finally, like I mentioned, uh, plant diversity, the biodiversity of any ecosystem is directly related to the um, diversity of plants in that ecosystem. So, uh, you know, you, when designing a green roof, you should think about, you know, including species, not only just numerous types of species, but um, sp species that have different vegetation heights, uh, create structural diversity um, in the landscape. Also, um, species that flower and bloom at different times of the year. So you're having some, uh, like a food source or a pollinator species that uh, can attract things for during the spring, summer, and fall. And then, um, again, the using native plants when possible. Uh, a lot of native plants have very deep root systems and uh, need a lot of water, but uh, it can be done on a green roof, and, and those are uh, valuable for the um, native uh, animal species using that roof because the animals have evolved over time with these native species and are basically used to eating them and using them as their um, habitat space and as their food source. And then this, uh, just a couple notes on uh, Tom's residence. It was uh, the first residential green roof to become a certified wildlife habitat. Uh, we've done a couple other wildlife habitat design designs in Grand Rapids, but this was by far the, took it to the highest level and um, was the first to become certified on a residential structure. So we used over 30 variety of plants, um, many native to Michigan. Uh, we'll get into some of the pictures later. You can see some of the plants that we use. But uh, again, the idea there is, you know, increasing that plant diversity. So we had over 30 varieties of plants. Um, varying heights of the plant structures. We had some plants that were very tall, like ornamental grasses, uh, and then lower growing, you know, sedum varieties. Uh, again, that, that structural diversity in heights is, creates edge effects, which is good for, uh, you know, birds like to forage and, and nest, you know, and, and work around those edges of different um, landscape structure. And then uh, soil depths on this one, we had a variety of depths from anywhere from 3 inches to 12 inches of soil. So we were able to, um, you know, build up soil in certain areas and create uh, some more uh, perennial type plantings. And then uh, the variety of substrate types on this project, we used uh, green roof media, um, native soil from the site, and then also gravel. So we had you know, varying substrate types as well. Uh, also included in this design was uh, habitat structures, which is kind of a unique idea, I think, as well, in terms of green roof design. Uh, that picture on the top is what we call a stem bundle. Uh, basically, that creates a uh, habitat space for invertebrates and insects. So um, I think Tom called it the bug condo, but, uh, <laughs> it, you know, the idea is creating habitat for bugs. That's going to lead to more birds eating those bugs and, and using the roof for habitat. And then, um, as we mentioned, we uh, fulfilled all the criteria um, in terms of design for getting a, a certified wildlife habitat by the National Wildlife Federation. Um, typically, those have been thought just on, you know, ground level landscapes, but we kind of applied this to the rooftops and really think it makes sense, especially in urban environments, to uh, try and bring this added value to what greeners can do, and, you know, in addition to stormwater and energy savings to increase biodiversity. So with that, I'll uh, let Jeremiah kind of take you through some of the, the project photos and show the sequence of, of how we uh, installed the roof. Thank you, Eric. Um, 
So I'll just take you through some of the product project photos. Uh, this is a picture Tom took in uh, 1978, um, about two months after uh, the house was built. And Tom initially, like he said, um, used native soil, um, roughly four inches, I do believe. And uh, he used what was at the time called a meadow in a can, which was a meadow mix and then a ryegrass um, seed that he sowed. And um, he, I think he irrigated it for the first few months to, to propagate it, five, first five months to, to get it propagated, to get it growing. Um, okay. And uh, he had, a, I mean, he did a brilliant job. He had a beautiful green roof system, as you can see here. This is a picture taken summer 2004. He, he really wasn't doing any maintenance, um, no irrigation, and uh, he had a healthy, thriving ecosystem, as you can see here. Um, had a very diverse mix of plants. Uh, a number of different perennials and grasses had evolved over the years, uh, with hardiest, I think, taking over. And, and you know, there were some shade areas, there were some sun areas. So, so it just evolved into a natural uh, meadow. He actually had uh, some grapes, grapevines that migrated onto the roof and started to go toward. They, st I think, they started in this right corner over here and started moving uh, all over the roof. Um, so when we got involved in the project, uh, it was because of, uh, like Sam said, a leaky roof. Um, the green roof, like I said, was was thriving, but the roof system had uh, leak issues. So this picture just shows you a couple of the areas that they found some leaks. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he does not want to see a tarp again. Um, they they found a couple areas. These are they tarped it prior to us. Uh, initiating the project. So, uh, as you saw, the, the vegetation was very intense and thick, and uh, this was, um, I'd say, the first of its kind. Uh, how exactly we were going to uninstall the green roof and put a new roof on um, was a question we uh, negotiated and, and, and reviewed in house. Weather Shield roofing systems actually. Uh, did the new roof and the uninstallation of the existing roof. So um, in the office there was a lot of discussions as to how are we going to get all this soil and plants and, and grapevines off the roof uh, efficiently. So this is a picture of uh, one of the weather shoot employees, Al, um, with a, a sickle slash mower uh, mowing down the vegetation. And at the, fr the front of the house, um, actually had a, had a huge uh, number of grapes hanging over and when we first walked up up to the home before we initiated the project you know we all thought it looked like a hobbit home which which was pretty awesome as you can see here and it's all hanging down and and you could barely see the house um, but this is just a picture showing uh, us taking down or starting to cut the vegetation back and, and begin to move remove the green, uh, green roof for the existing soil so I think this uh, picture was was a time uh, Tom was probably the most nervous when he had a, a sky trek uh, shoveling the roof um, as you can see here I don't think this has been done many times in the world so it's kind of interesting but the first we used the sky track uh, as far as we could go to take off existing soil as carefully as we could um, try to find the best sky track driver at weather shield to do this job um, and then we used, um, the plan was to use uh, some of the existing soil that was on the roof in three different areas of the new green roof. So um, we kept uh, as, as cleanly as we could um, some of the existing soil and vegetation and uh, put it on site, stored it on site uh, until the new green roof was installed. As you can imagine, um, it was very labor intensive to remove uh, this existing green, green roof. It, it had a drainage layer of sorts, and as you can see over time, uh, there was a huge amount of, of soil that built up. So this was manual labor. It had to be shoveled off, um, and, uh, and this is just a picture showing, showing uh, the shoveling off of uh, existing soil and, and roots and plants. Just a picture of uh, one of the leaks they found. 
let's see. Um, they Tom ended up wanting uh, added insulation um, installed. So this is a uh, uh, just a picture of four. The, they were adding four inches of insulation board. Um, it added up to I believe R seventy. Uh, from 28 to R70 uh, insulation value. A picture of the new uh, TPO membrane being laid down. Um, Tom finally relaxed when the membrane started to go down because you never know when you're putting insulation if you get a random cloud, rain cloud, you could be in trouble. Just another picture of the membrane. So after the membrane was installed, we laid down a protective slip sheet and then uh, this is the advanced green roof built up tray system being installed. And how that works, as you can see here, um, the trays, they're trays, but they're not full modules, I would say. And, and the, it acts as a drainage layer. Um, we have an, what we call AGR Aquamat, which retains and spreads water. Um, so this is laid down, it, it integrates as a grid. And then after this is laid down, um, I got a picture, I'll go back to that one. Soil is blown in. Um, we like to blow in soil because it's, uh, it's efficient, it's, it's cost effective, and with uh, some of our designs, and this one in particular, which was pretty intense, we're able to contour the soil. They, at least these guys that blow the soil are able to contour the soil. As you've seen from the design, we had some inches that were three inches of, of soil depth other areas that we had six, other areas that were 12. So by blowing the soil in, they can, we can tell them exactly where to put three inches versus six to eight to 12, um, and, and they're in and out in about a half day. Tom uh, wanted a pond uh, to, to, to get the roof certified. You need a, a, a water source, but he wanted a pond. So the perfect client for us because we've never done a pond on a roof. So, so this is, as you can see on the left, uh, EPS, uh, they formed a, a pond out of EPS and it sat on top of the trays so that water could drain underneath uh, the roof system. The gravel path um, that was to be designed in and a, and a um, there was to be a bench in this area. So an area for sitting, for uh, hanging out on the roof. Uh, in front of the pond. This is just a picture of uh, the plants, uh, sedum sod, um, sedum su succulent sod mix that was to be installed. Picture just showing us installing uh, the actual plants after the soil was blown in. As you can see, the majority of the roof is actually sedum and the depth is three inches. Um, and then we had pods, so to speak, of perennials and grasses native to Michigan. And like I said, three different areas that were native, we reused the native soil. And then one area, Tom wanted to test uh, just, just the seed mix, another, so to speak, meadow in the can area. So we had one area in the back where we just seeded and it's just kind of a test area. It's another picture of the, of the sedum going down. And it goes down really quick. I mean, it's just like sod. After the soil's blown in, it whips down um, quickly. This is a pair, uh, picture just showing of, of one of the areas that we reused the native vegetation um, and kind of integrated it with the sedum day one. It, uh, it was beaten up a little bit, but about two to three months after we installed it, this stuff was just growing, going crazy. Picture of the pond, another picture of the installation. A very happy time. And we had a beer summit afterward. Local beer. <laughs> Local beer. And the owner of Weathershield said uh, this would probably be the only roof he'd want to do a beer summit on. <laughs> Not other, his other roofs look like this. And just some final pictures. So if, if you guys have any questions, I think we're behind. But if, uh, if you want to catch us at the end, that's fine. <laughs>